What's up, everyone? My name is Philip Hensler. And I'm Adam Richman. And we're your co-hosts for today's PATHS Technology Committee podcast. We started this podcast to initiate a conversation with the members of the athletic training community in Pennsylvania in the hopes that we can engage and foster relationships in the state, explore emerging settings, and provide a unique perspective into the day in the life of an athletic trainer. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Today, I want to thank our guest, Larry Cooper, for taking time out of his busy schedule to come sit down with us at the Pats Podcast. Larry, how are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me on, on today. Appreciate it. It's good to see you again. So um, I wanted to start out today. I want to ask you, how did you get to this point in your career? Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> um, so you want me to start from the beginning? Let's hear it. Beginning. <laughs> Where'd you go to school? How did you, you know, how did you, what was your first job? What was well, your second job? How did, how did, how did your career path go? I didn't get into athletic training the traditional way. I, I went to school originally for uh, wrestling. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I went to, I went to, you didn't school. go to, sc yeah, you, you went, you didn't go to play school. Yeah. I went to school for business administration and I just couldn't see myself as a suit and tie behind the desk person. And um, I had an uncle introduce me to the profession. That was before Google and technology. And he said, I think this might be a fit for you. And so I, I uh, looked into it, did as much investigation as we could at that point in time, visited a few schools, got into Pitt, and the rest is history. Um, had some great mentors, Dave Perrin, Kip Smith, both um, NATA Hall of Famers. Um, Fran Feld, Rex Call, um, Tony Incrovaya, just great mentors. And I had a great experience. I was able to work football, I worked the Fiesta Bowl and the Sugar Bowl. Um, you know, I was there when in the pit heydays with Dan Marino and company. And I, you know, I just, it was an amazing experience. And uh, I, I had a, um, we, we called it field experience back then where you went and you got to choose what, um, setting you want to go to and I went to Baldwin High School in uh, Baldwin Whitehall and Joe Murray was the uh, athletic trainer there and he was an absolute amazing individual and I, I knew that I wanted to work at secondary school before that but he sold me on it I mean he, he was a fisherman and he got me hook line and sinker with, <laughs> with uh, um, the secondary school setting um, what's really interesting too is I met my wife there. She was not a student though. <laughs> uh, and I, I've never looked back. I've never, I, I, I gotta be honest. I, I think the secondary school is an absolute career destination. It's not a stepping stone like some people think. And I have been blessed with every job that I've, I've had that um, I've had good people around me. I've had good mentors. I've had good administration. So, you know, I, I it started off non-traditional, but I've been blessed beyond belief. Um, my first job was, an, it was actually, um, Tony, do you guys know Tony Salisi from Pitt? Don't know. He, yes. he hired me for a, a clinic job, and I worked at um, Highland High School for yeah. two, two weeks. <laughs> and I got a call in Arlington, Virginia, for a full-time position as a teacher athlete trainer and the, the pay was significantly more. Um, that was not the reason. Uh, the opportunity to actually, I was the first athletic trainer in Arlington County, Virginia, and they were a very progressive school district. Um, there was a gentleman, his name was John Youngblood. He was the district athletic director, and he was heavily engaged with the NFHS. And one of the things he said to me during the interview, he said, um, we really want you to volunteer we, we really think there's some benefits in volunteerism for our staff. Um, would, would you like to do that? And I said, I'd be honest with you. I'm, you know, I'm just starting out my career. I'm not sure. He says, well, if you decide to take this job, you will volunteer. And I'm, I thank goodness. Thank God for that, that little nudge, that little push, you know, because my life has been benefited beyond my wildest dreams from that volunteerism. Um, 
and, and I gotta, I gotta back up just a little bit because it wasn't just him. My parents were, were very instrumental in that too, because they, they volunteered and did things for people in the community. And you learn from that, you know, you, you, you're around that, you learn from it. So um, when I told my parents about that in the interview, they, they thought that was awesome. They, they thought that was, you know, it was a good start. You know, it was yeah. kind of a nice, a nice um, gelling moment, so to speak. And I, I stayed in Arlington, Virginia for eight years as a teacher and athletic trainer. And I, I actually helped, I, I developed the job position that still holds down there today as a, um, a part-time teacher, part-time athletic trainer, and then a supplement for after-school activities. And that way you, you taught um, two classes or three classes, and then you did the athletic training and you know all the paperwork and documentation and stuff. And then you got a, a supplement um, for your after school activities. And then, um, I guess it was 1990. Um, both my parents had some, um, issues with health and it started my wife and I thinking about maybe we want to move back closer to our family. You know, we were four hours away, my wife's from Pittsburgh. And, um, so we started looking and then my dad had a pretty significant heart attack and we started talking about it a little bit more and um, we moved, we moved back and I got a job with the East Suburban Sports Medicine Center in Monroeville and I was their head athletic trainer. We had eight contracts and um, I got, one of them was Penn Trafford. One of them, um, they had Gateway Plum, East Allegheny, Riverview, a couple others. And I, and I um, got to choose which school I wanted. And I chose Penn Trafford because it had no lights. So I thought, <laughs> I didn't like, that's brilliant. You know, well, it's not like Friday, that anymore out there. <laughs> Friday nights, I'll be free, you know, spend more time because I was starting a family, you know, Saturday games, but it doesn't take up all your nights. Well, fast forward three or four years and they had lights and everything was at night, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, that, that's what, I left the East Suburban after a year and a half, got a full-time teaching position at um, Penn Trafford as well as the athletic trainer and just been blessed. Uh, the staff, the administration always, they, they really um, were good about my volunteering. They, they actually encouraged it. Um, they could see the benefit from the, the school got from me volunteering and, and bringing back new ideas or, um, keeping abreast of changes in our profession through that. So, you know, I, I can't say it enough. I've, I've been truly blessed with great people um, that I've had, had the opportunity to work with. Awesome, Coop. That's, that's a great, um, great segue into, you know, let's talk about your, your volunteering and, you know, what, what are some of the highlights, you know, what, what have you, what are some highlights of your career that you have had in either, you know, the Pennsylvania Athletic Training Society, the NATA, um, what are some, some big things that you remember throughout your career? And, you know, what are maybe some projects you're working on currently? Well, I, I think probably the biggest thing that I've gotten out of volunteerism is the relationships. I have, I have some lifelong friends from people that I've served on committees or boards with or task force or, you know, whatever. They are lifelong, absolute great friends and that I would have never had the chance to meet or, or collaborate with if I wouldn't have volunteered. Um, I had an opportunity when I was in Virginia, I was, they have a, an organization called Northern Virginia Sports Medicine Association, and I was the vice president, and <clears throat> they, they, um, in Northern Virginia, it's a little bit different than around here, you, you know, let's take, for example, the WPIL in Pittsburgh, where you have, you know, hundreds of schools. Well, that was the same way down there. And there was athletic trainers at every school and we would have monthly meetings and we would bring in guest speakers and physicians and, you know, things like that. So, um, we had an opportunity. I, I got into scheduling meetings and running meetings and reaching out to people in the, in the medical community. So, you know, you, you, I developed those relationships very quickly or the ability to reach out to them. And then I moved back to, to Pennsylvania and I worked as a regional rep in Virginia too. I met some great people there, um, some hall of famers there as well. <laughs> and then I moved back to Pennsylvania. And the first thing I did is I um, reached out to 
John Hoff. He was the president and I asked him um, if there was anything I could do. I'm new to the, the state. And uh, I took over the um, membership, okay. the membership chair. And well, you start to, you know, you start to send out stuff and you have a list of everybody's name and their contact information. And when you go to meetings, you realize who the movers and shakers are, you know? And yep. so I had, I had a connection, you know, um, I'd, I'd be able to go up and talk to him. You know, how, how are things at um, um, Dickinson? You know, how, you know what, what's new in your college setting? And, and you could be able, you had the ability to make a connection, to make that conversation. And uh, from that point, I just said, you know, anything I can do, let me know. And I, I went from the membership. I went to the secondary school. I went to a regional, regional rep, parliamentarian. Um, you know, just served any way I possibly could to help the profession because I, like I said, you, you just, the relationships you develop and then, um, I was asked to serve on the NATA secondary school committee and, you know, we all have doubts. And I think Kobe Bryant just said it recently. There was a quote on it. You know, we all have doubts, no matter how, how we are where we are in our re professional relationship with, with our job or anywhere we, we, we have doubt and I had sure. doubt too, you know, here I'm, I'm going on a national stage, you know, yeah. and, and I don't know so much a, a doubt of my ability as much as my ability to clearly look globally and make decisions based on that rather than for me. And I think that's one thing with leadership that you have to be able to do yet. You can't look at it as, my, you know, how can I improve my situation? You have to look at improving everybody's situation in our profession. Yeah. And, um, I was, I was told um, after my term was up that I should run for the secondary school chair for the NATA. And I did. And I'll tell you, it was probably the best de decision I ever made in my life. It was just, um, I've learned so much about myself, but about our other people in our profession. I've been able to travel to every NATA district twice. In, oh, in wow. Presentations. Nice. Um, I served on the NFHS Sports Medicine Advisory Committee. Um, and it, and when, when you get your name out there, you know, doors open. I would say it opens up doors and, for sure. Yeah, and, and I've been... I, I've, I'm going to say this more, but I, I've been blessed. Those doors open and I've had been a part of some very amazing um, committees, task force projects that, that have um, benefited the profession um, most importantly, but have, have created relationships all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. And opened up those doors for sure. Yeah. So Larry, why, so volunteering and community outreach is one of the things that I absolutely love doing. It's part of the profession that really drives me over the last few years. Why do you think it's so effective? What, what do you think about volunteering in the community outreach is so, um, I guess, um, is so rewarding both personally and professionally for you? I think that I'm, I'm a people person. I'll, I can talk to anybody. Ask my wife. <laughs> she gets mad at me because I, I'll strike up a conversation with anybody. And, and I think <laughs> when, when you are a people person, that you, you thrive on those relationships, those, those connections that you can make, and you make them in a professional level, they become even more important. And then when you, when you get together and you um, collaborate and you can actually promote or improve our profession, man, that's, that's intoxicating. You know, it, it really is. I, I'm going to pull a picture out here. I want to show you something here. <clears throat> Here's a picture. I don't know if you guys can, if the glare. Yeah. No, I can see yeah. it. I can see it. So that's a, a picture of a napkin that the three guys, Ronnie Harper, Rob Huggins, and myself, we sat in a restaurant called Dos Caminos in New York City. And that's where Atlas, you guys heard of the Atlas project? Yep. That's how it came about. We closed the place down. 
<laughs> we're coming up with a name on a on a napkin, and I'm telling you, it, it was surreal because you hear about you know ideas on napkins and stuff like that you know yep. and it, it truly happened and now i have two lifelong friends and it's had an impact on our profession across the country we've had states that um ot's and pt's are going after our, our practice act yep and through atlas and the data we've collected we've been able to reach out and rally the troops and go to cal you know go to the capitol and, and and actually defend our profession where we wouldn't have been able to do that. And that in itself, I'm, I'm still proud of. Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell, just for the listeners who might not know a lot about it, can you just explain what that is and, and you know, what it does? Well, Atlas is, uh, stands for Athletic Training Location and Services. And I'm a firm believer you don't know where you're going, don't know where to go until you know where you're at. And so we had to – we had to document every secondary school in the, in the country, what type of athletic training services they had to find out where we needed to focus our energy at the national level to come up with an athletic trainer at every secondary school. And so what we did is we come up with a, an online questionnaire and people, you know, we send it out. First of all, UConn and Rob Huggins and his staff did a tremendous job calling every school unfortunately they spoke to secretaries and nurses and principals who had no clue okay. so what we did is we started um cross-referencing with um department of education statistics and things like that and between all of the state secondary school athletic trainers committees we were able to get every school into atlas where we have information on every secondary school, public or private, in the country. And it asks questions like, do you have an AED? Do you have a, a standing order? Do you have more than one athletic trainer? Are you, full, are you full-time, part-time, um, or per diem? Um, are you school-based, clinic-based? Um, you know, all these different questions. And so what we've been able to do is get, collect all this demographic data, um, and, and be able to channel some energy towards um, addressing where these deficits were for athletic training services. This is where we found out that 37% have full-time athletic training services wow. across the country. 33 have um, part-time, and you know there's still a large percent don't have. We would not have known that that particular information unless we would have come up with Atlas. And it's grown into, I think this is the seventh year. Um, everybody knows Atlas now. Everybody knows, you know, the Atlas project. Everybody knows that every other year now we go in when we, if you work in a secondary school, when you renew your NAT at yeah, the BOC, it, it prompts you to go and do it. Yeah, and, that's brilliant. You know, it's, it's yeah. just been an amazing ride. To, to be able to, you know, three minds just sitting there. And, and I got to be honest, we're having a couple of beers, you know, <laughs> and, and you start thinking, well, there's a way we can do this. And then somebody go, yeah, we could do this. And, and before you know it, Ronnie Harper from Louisiana, he was doing a, have you ever heard of Z maps? Uh, maybe it's like a mapping service. You okay. know, how if you go onto Google maps and you, you, um, you can pin pin. Yeah. Okay, well, Z Maps was a pinning thing, so he he went in Louisiana and pinned every high school, okay. and then he gave them different colors for full time, part time, no, you know, per diem or no athletic trainer, right. and then they could see where these pockets were and where they could channel their their energy resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Oh, that's awesome, and so it's grown and and developed, and honestly. We have legislators, legislators in Pennsylvania, legislators in, in states across the country who look at Atlas now and the distribution of athletic trainers. They say, well, look, my district is very poorly represented. We need to do something about this. And now they are ju jumping on the bandwagon and say, we need to protect the youth of our, of our society. We need an athletic trainer in there. So it's created opportunities across the country and I'm, I'm just glad I was a small part of it, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a 
big, big deal. Like, uh, you know, that's what we, we need more athletic trainers in the high schools, right? Like, I think that needs to be a primary focus. And um, obviously, you've just played a huge part in that, Coop. So thank you. Small. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be modest. Um, but okay, so let's let's transition into um, your current role. Um, so you are retired from the high school. Yes. Um, but you're not done. Like you said, when we were talking a little bit offline. Um, can you just describe your typical day now? Um, what, what, what does a typical day look like? And what projects are you working on? Well, um, my typical day is I get up like I used to, and I get, I work out. That's the first thing I do. I've always done that my, my entire career. I get up and work out. And then, you know, answer emails and, and things like that. But um, one of the projects I've been working on now is a, a basic athletic training book. Um, and awesome. uh, it, it's at the publisher right now. It's geared towards uh, high school, so, you know, secondary school, junior, senior, and freshman in college, basic athletic training course. Um, Does it have a title? Okay. It does basic athletic training. Basic athletic training. Yeah. and um, you know, I'm I'm gonna pull something up here. Um, I don't know if you guys will be able to see it. It it'll, it should be out here real soon. And I was gonna say, do you have a release date? Not yet. There's the there's the cover of it. Oh, that's cool. brilliant! Love that. So now, is it geared towards um, educating? uh the high school and freshmen on what athletic training is or is it more geared towards just the basics about being physically active it is to um engage them in rudimentary or fu foundational information on athletic training and okay. um it, to kind of pique their interest a little bit to, to dive in a little bit more um certainly we could have gone in more in depth right but I, I wanted to, you know, unfortunately, and I say this, and this is not just this generation, this is across, you know, the world, across all time, a little bit of information can make you dangerous. So we wanted to make it an, an educational um, book and not focus on anything um, service wise or treatment wise for a, a young kid we just want to you know pique their interest as far as educational content okay so your target target audience is is um high school athletes or high school students high school students high school students. athletes would be great yeah yeah, yeah. And, and also freshmen in college yeah uh, it, you know it, it's interesting you mentioned that because i taught sports medicine at penn right. traffic for my entire career and a lot of the students that we got were athletes that wanted yeah. to know more about their body, how to, you know, how it reacted to stresses and um, adaptations to training. So, yeah. yeah we, th we those are my favorite students as well, right? The ones that want to know why. Um, the yeah. ones that come in and do their do the work, it's great. But the ones that actually ask the questions and really want to know why they're doing what they're doing are the, the best at or the best uh patience to work with in my opinion. Well, not only that, oh, but yeah. they keep you on your toes. Yeah, they you know, it's like, well, okay, you're right. I do okay. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I I love wrestling. Um <clears throat> I always tease people that I played volleyball in high school, but <laughs> 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 they 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 always call BS. But um I love the sport of wrestling because for two reasons. For as an athlete you you can't blame anybody else if you fail. Absolutely. It's on you. It's on yep. you. And then as an athletic trainer, you better have your A game with you every single day because if it's a match, you have an, a minute and a half yeah. to determine whether or not they're able to return or not. And, and if you're unsure, if you're not bringing your A game, boy, the kids, the parents, and the, you know, the coaches, they can yep. tell right away. So you better be on top of it. Absolutely. Uh, going back to the book, though, um, could you talk about what that process looked like? Like, how did you – like what sparked your interest to do that? You know, how long is it taking you to get it to publication? Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. I would love to know. Well, it, it, it's interesting. Um, it's the same. This is the uh, seventh edition of this book. Okay. Okay. And it hasn't been done. It hasn't been updated for about 10 years. And I was at a joint committee meeting for the NATA right now. It'd be one year ago and two weeks, one, one year, and two weeks ago today and i was stopped by an individual and said um hey larry I, I have a project if you're interested and i said oh yeah what's that 
and he said, um, it was Kenneth Wright, and he said, uh, our book needs updated, and I'd like to have you be the lead lead author on that. And I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit daunting, huh? I said, I, I don't know. And, and I'll be honest with you, my initial gut feeling is, Larry, you are not. A, you know, a publisher, you're not one to write a book, you know, yeah, I'll go out and I'll work and I'll get my, my hands dirty and work in the trenches, but I just didn't see myself doing that. And, uh, he was pretty persistent. He called me and he, um, sent me a letter and sent me an email <laughs> and, um, I talked to my wife and then my kids and, um, I talked to my mom and dad and yeah, we thought, you know what, go for it. So, um, in December, we f I finished the book, and okay. the publisher right now they've completed. As of two weeks ago, they completed twelve of the fourteen chapters, reviewing and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then once they put everything in the position, you know, with the pictures and questions and in the content, then I get to go through it and and find you know give it the okay or see if there's any changes we want. Um, the people that I've worked with, Ken Wright, um, Tim, Tim Neal from Michigan. He's a hall. Both those are hall of famers. And then uh, Randy Deer from, uh, uh, he's also a collegiate guy. Th they've been phenomenal. I've learned so much from them. And uh, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. I leaned on a lot of connections that I have. Sure. A lot of, a lot of people that I've met, um, for example, for example, Jeff Conan, if you guys know Jeff, if you don't know Jeff, you need to, you need to meet him. He is just a unbelievable mind. He's like the energizer bunny. He just is constantly going and he's a, a trendsetter. He, he really sees things, you know, ahead yeah. of time. So he's been traveling all over the world, not just the country, the world on um, CBD in treatment of injuries. Okay. Yeah. In athletic training. Well, that was one thing that's ne not been addressed in any book. And so I relied on him for his expertise and we have, you know, we, we worked this into the book because it's nice. not going away. Okay. No, you know, yeah. I um, mean, I think, it, yeah, I think it's beneficial, right? It's just, I know in my setting, it's, it's difficult. We can't really, um, so we, I mean, we have um, drug testing, so not sure on the products and their, their, their quality, so we, we, we recommend that they don't just so that it, you know, in case right. there is any THC in it. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like you said, the trends are going towards it being a positive, you know, uh, aid in recovery and, and other, especially concussions and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm very interested to see where that goes. And, and then the very okay. least, spar go ahead. Sorry, Larry. No, that's okay. Go ahead. At the very least spar some uh, conversation to get some research on it and, and to see how it really is affecting our athletes, making sure it's a good way to go. I mean, um, yeah. And, and and let's be honest with you. They might listen to us and they might take our advice, but if they want to do it, they're going to do it at home, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're not going to tell you. And so you want to, you want to educate them. You know, there used to be a store out here in Pittsburgh an educated consumer is our best customer was their motto. And I'll tell you, that's really, that's really true. You know, the more we have these athletes educated, the better they're going to be when they come into the athletic training room and, and, the entire process. Um, another thing we addressed was vaping. I mean, vaping okay. is huge. Um, and there's a gentleman, uh, John Seco. He's out in Michigan. Yeah. Um, he does the sports medicine broadcast. Okay. You guys know John? I don't know, but I've heard great, of him. I've, I've heard him. Yep. Yeah. Great guy. Um, I've got to know him pretty well. And he developed an amazing um, vaping policy for his school district. And um, he had a ton of research. So, you know, I, I brought him into the process and we have a, a, a nice section on vaping and, you know, the, the types of vaping and, and why it's bad for you. And um, I mean, just, I, I really tried to sit down and think, look at this book and say, what is it? What are we not including in this book? What can we advance this on what can we make it more palatable for the secondary school athletic trainer to use to teach and um i think i think I i'm very happy with the end product um i think you guys will be be happy with it too I mean, you know it's not i didn't get 
involve to be wealthy because <laughs> I'm not, not going to be wealthy from it. You know, no. it just, that unfortunately, the, the money's not there in books. I, unfortunately. I'm not going to be like Harry Potter, you know, yeah. the author there. I'm not going to be like her, J, J.K. Rowling. But um, <laughs> certainly this, you know, it's going to be beneficial for um, students and for staff, hopefully for years to come. Yeah. What has been your coolest experience afforded to you as being an athletic trainer? Ooh. That, you know, I can honestly tell you that I can't pick one, but I can, there, there's, there's a couple that are very similar that I think that you'll understand why it's hard for me to, um, to actually pick just one. Um, I've been able to teach sports medicine, you know, at the secondary school level for a long time. And, you know, hopefully I, I always, you know, wanted to, um, share my knowledge and share my passion for athletic training with others. And um, I've had students that have become athletic trainers and just, you know, come up to me at meetings or um, send me a card and say, I just passed my BOC or, you know, invite me to their wedding you know, <laughs> or whatever. But th those, those are so important to me because the relationships you develop are, are more important than anything you do. Um, I'm a firm believer in, in yeah. relationships and um, you, there's a quote and I, I'm probably going to, you know, destroy this, but you know, you can tell how wealthy a per person is by their, their relationships. They're not, and, and I really truly feel that I am very, very wealthy because I, I've had the opportunity to meet so many people and develop a relationship with, and those ones that you develop it with the, um, your students and your athletes are, are, are the best bar none. Um, and then I, I just, you know, explain to you, to you, to, to you guys, you know, there's certain phone calls you get. Um, like when I, when I received, um, notice I was getting into the Pennsylvania athletic trainers hall of fame and, um, the, the, the NATA MDAT, the most distinguished athletic trainer with a, a NATA second uh, um, service award. And then um, Sunday, just, just this past Sunday, uh, I get a phone call from uh, AJ Duffy and which is not unusual because yeah, I'm, right. the, I'm the district secretary and we talk quite a bit, you know, but I knew he was in Dallas. I had already returned. I just got home. Uh, from the joint committee meeting and uh, he'd been texting me about some mundane stuff and he normally doesn't do that. It's always about athletic training, you know? And I, I was like, what's going on? And then about 10 o'clock, you know, he calls and he goes, cool, hold on. And uh, Tori Lindley got on NATA president mm -hmm. and uh, told me I was being inducted into the NATA hall of fame. And, uh, I was, first of all, I was speechless. Um, second of all, I had tears in my eyes. Yeah. And I couldn't, my, my brain was like a tornado. I couldn't put together a thought, you know, a, a thought that made any sense to anybody <laughs> else than me. <laughs> and uh, that, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, congratulations! That is, it's, it, I'm honored to have you on the uh, <laughs> podcast with us, our first NATA Hall of Fame member. So, well, congratulations! Well deserved, Larry. Well deserved. Yeah. But you know, the the best moments I've had I've had former athletes that um, they bring their kids to me and ask me if I would look at their yeah. their yeah. child's injuries. Um, I've I went back and I, I want to share this because I think this is really important for everyone to, to understand about our setting. When I worked in Virginia, it was my first job and <clears throat> the people that you work with kind of, you, you have formed yourself, but they help mold you into the person that you're going to be. Yeah. And I worked at a, um, two different high schools down there, Washington Lee High School and Wakefield High School. And the athletes there were, were tremendous people. And when I say tremendous people, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, polite, athletic, respectful, pillars of the community. 
And they invited me, this one guy, his name was Chris Higdon, and he um, became really close. We became really close. And I, we, uh, I cut grass in the summer, and he worked for me, and I was building decks and he'd help, and we did roofing, and he'd help me, and we became very, very close. Well, him and his buddy, um, um, I, 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 I'm losing his name right <laughs> But they have a Christmas party every year. And every year they would invite me back down. And I couldn't because I was working. You know, it was right about the time of Christmas tournaments, basketball, wrestling tournaments, all these different stuff. Well, about eight years ago, I decided I had a weekend off. I'm going to surprise them. And I went down and brought tears to their eyes. <laughs> and they said, Kubo, we never thought we'd see you again the rest of our lives. <laughs> and you know, hugs and and and. You know, we're talking and we're sharing stories and and they're telling stories that I probably forgot about 10 minutes after I told them, but they, they latched on, you know, <laughs> and we, we've become fast friends. We, we are fast friends here. There's Chris and I right there. Oh man. He came to my, my retirement party. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Relationships. You don't know how much of a role model you are in the in the secondary school setting until later. I mean, we know that we're role models, but you don't know how much influence you had until later on in life. And it, it's just it, those are the best. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Just, no, that, that's another great segue, um, Coop. You know what? making those relationships and being impactful is, is, is part of being an athletic trainer. Right. And like you said, it, it takes some time to realize your impact. Um, but what, you know, if you have one piece of advice for young professionals um, and, and how to make that impact or, you know, how to build those relationships you talked about, um, you know, what, what would, be, what would that advice be for a young professional? Well, I, that's, that's multi-tiered and I apologize for this. It's multi-tiered because there's, n it's not cookie cutter. You know, you have each situation a little bit different. First of all, understand you're a role model. That's number one. And, and do not cross that line. You know, you are an adult. They look up to you. They, look, they want some um, knowledge from you. They want some expertise from you. They want guidance from you. And, and don't take that lightly because that's very, very important. You can make or break a person. Second of all, <clears throat> we have opportunities in our profession to meet people every single day. And, and I can, I can tell you that every person I've come in contact with, whether it be a parent or another athletic trainer or a student athlete, they have, they have left something with me to help me become a better person, a better athletic trainer, a better friend, a better husband, whatever. If you just go through your day and you don't learn something from them, th then I don't think you're getting the full experience. You're not able to, to do everything that you should be doing. And, and I, I know that this, I, I know for a fact that people get tired of hearing about phones and the, the issues with them. I grew up without a phone and I didn't have a cell phone until I was 31 years old. I could live without a phone absolutely could live without a cell phone. I call it an electronic leash. <laughs> but, but we need to move away from our phones and start interacting with people like we are right now. The relationships aren't based on the text messages. The relationships are, met, are based on the time that you spend together and conversing and, and making that connection with. And, and we have to get back to that. I, I see more and more people doing that you know, and I see like these um, cable companies um, where you can control phones and stuff like that yeah. during dinner or during a party time. Uh, you know, it's it's a shame we have come to that point, but we have to get back to that. Um, Coop, I just saw a study on that actually that we are the the, st the statistics are going more in the favor. So we have all this connection online, but. You, people feel more lonely now than they ever have, right? Yeah. Even though they have this constant social media, this constant interaction with people, it's not the same as actually interacting with people live. Like, I think we know that. So I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, that's my opinion. But, and, and 
because I grew up without a cell phone. I know what it was like and I know those relationships that I made before cell phones. And, and even now I try and as little as possible, you know, be on this. Like I told you, it's blowing up now, but <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, uh, they're good, but they're also bad. And we have to yeah. realize that, you know, in our lives, we, we've got to be able to make those connections and you don't do that through the phones. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, that again, um, just kind of moving on then, you know, like you said, there's uh, cell phones can be good. Something else that can be good is sun exposure, right? Like that's, it's good for vitamin D, but too much sun exposure can, can have some issues. Um, and you know, I, I saw recently on social media that you had some, some issues there with um, some, some skin cancer um, type stuff there. Do you mind just telling us a little bit about your experience with, with that? And, and, and again, some, maybe some advice for some young professionals or pretty much anybody out there in the athletic training room world that is, um, you know, out in the sun all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I put that out there for a reason and that, and that was to help one person. And I got to be honest with you, I've had dozens and dozens of people reach out to me and ask me questions and, you know, about the treatment and this and that. So it, it was worth it for me. It was worth it. Absolutely. Um, I've ha had melanoma. I had melanoma in my back um, about eight years ago and had surgery and I've been very f fortunate, you know, that I have insurance and, and that I can go in on a regular basis and get checked out. And every time I go in, I, you know, I get a dozen or so um, spots frozen off, and they, you know, spots taken off my ear and, you know, my cheek and this and that, mostly around my temples. And I'd like to say it was just because I, you know, I was a beach bum, but I'm, but I'm not, you know, I was outside my entire life. And when I was younger, we didn't really have sunscreen. Right. And so I was outside. I worked in a, a swimming pool. I worked cutting grass all day, never had a shirt on. And then when I, um, about 20 years ago, um, I started seeing some, you know, more and more information on sun exposure. So I started wearing, you know, a wide brim hat and sunscreen and things like that. And it, it didn't matter because for the last 20 years, I've been very conscientious and it's the cumulative effect, you know, right. just like concussions, mm -hmm. you know, the small yep. sub concussive hits. Well, for the last <laughs> almost 60 years, I've been out <laughs> of time and, yeah, it's the cumulative effect. Right. So when I went in this last time, he said, Coop, there's, there's just too many. We can't freeze them off. Um, you have a couple options. One's a chemical peel. One's a um, chemotherapy cream. And, and he said, what do you want to do? And I said, what would you do? And he said, I would do the cream. So I said, let's go. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, it's going to be painful. It's going to be, um, <clears throat> it's going to be, disfiguring you know you're you're going to be very self-conscious about it but i said it's okay let's go you know because i i call it a twig in a road not a bump in a road it's like a little twig in a road you know yeah. you, you got to take care of yourself you got to do these things and so like i have a swimming pool um i'm i i swim not a ton but i you know i'm out there i put some, i lather on the sunscreen i limit how much time i'm out there and I'm going to have to do it even more now because I'm, you know, it's a cumulative type of uh, yeah. effect. I taught phys ed. I was outside. I was an athletic trainer. I was outside, you know, um, my, I, I run, I'm outside. I bike, I'm outside. It's just, you know, it's who yeah. I am. And if you're an athletic trainer, we don't do a very good job of taking care of ourselves. So we need to do a better job. And that's, you know, putting on the sunscreen, wearing the sunglasses, wearing a wide brim hat, wearing the long sleeve shirts, um, one of the things he said, he goes, your right side's worse than your left side. He goes, I have no idea why. And I said, I can tell you why. He goes, why? And I said, because when I, where I stood on the field, yep. I got the afternoon sun every single yep. day for every day. Day practices. And he goes, oh, that's really interesting. You know, so w we are very good at taking others. It's time we start taking care of ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Coop. I, I think everybody appreciates that, and hopefully everybody pays attention. Yeah, me too. Wear those wide brim hats. What's um, what's your dream job? I know, I know you've been through a career, you've had amazing experiences, but what would be a dream uh, career for uh, for Coop? I had it. 
All right, next question. I, I, <laughs> that's I'm awesome. Sure. No, that's. I, I, if I could just real briefly tell you why. Absolutely. Please. I I worked in the community that I lived. I was able to have my daughters in in class as an athlete in sports medicine and in phys ed. I got to see him as student athletic trainers working with me. I got to see him as athletes because they all three of them were athletes as well. Um, I get to spend more time with my kids than than most parents do, and I wouldn't trade that for a second. Um, second of all, the community that I I live and work in is is a really neat, awesome community. I think Philip, you you can probably attest to that since you you, you work there, but. It's, it's different. It, it's almost a throwback to yesteryear where you have a lot of parent involvement. You have a lot of student engagement in athletics and the theater and the arts and stuff like that. So it was a great community, a great school community to, to be in. And my administration was very supportive in anything I did. I, I couldn't have asked for a, a more supportive administration. They, they encouraged my volunteerism. Um, they saw the benefit from it. And, and they honestly, I can tell you, they never denied me an opportunity that I would present to them. And, and so I, I really feel like I had a dream job. Um, and I lived 1.2 miles from the school. So <laughs> I had, I had no commute. No, uh, take the I, golf cart home at night. <laughs> <laughs> if I chose to ride my bike or run to work, I could do that. Um, I, I, I can honestly tell you it was a dream job. Nice. Coop, what do you do for fun? What, uh, what activities outside of athletic training? I, well, I, I'm, <laughs> there's a lot of things I like to do. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a woodworker. I do a oh, lot. Yeah. I make, I make furniture, um, build decks. Uh, I'm a biker. I mm -hmm. do There's two other athletic trainers and I, we do a lot of mountain biking together cool. and, uh, I run, I, I, is a little known fact. I, I run a, a thousand miles a year, okay. a thousand miles a year. I've done that for the last, uh, 39 years. All right. And, uh, I, I know I don't look like I am a runner, but uh, <laughs> more like a Clydesdale, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm still out there plugging away. Yeah. Um, and and I, I like going to Jimmy Buffett concerts. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And Love we it. travel. My my wife and I were avid campers. We've traveled to forty nine states. Nice. Uh, we still have Alaska to, to do. Okay. But, um, nice. We we loved love to camp and and connect with nature. Nice. And you know what else I love to do for fun? This is this is no lie. Volunteer. There you yes. go. Absolutely. Because you get a lot out of it. Absolutely. Really do. Absolutely. What, uh, what inspires you? What drives you in the morning to get up and do your running? What, what, what keeps you going and keeps you talking? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I, th I think there's, there's a couple of things that motivate me. And one is uh, Jimmy Buffett has a, uh, has a song and it. One of the sayings in there is you can treat your body like a temple or treat it like a tent or you, you treat your body like a, I treat my body like a temple. You treat yours like a tent. I've always felt that, you know, I want to treat my body well because I want to be around to harass my kids as long as possible. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I, this is, this is, if I take care of myself, I can do all the things I want to do. And yeah. so that, that first, you know, that motivates me to continue to work out. Um, second of all, I can eat as much ice cream as I want when I work there you out. Go. <laughs> you, do you guys know that tomorrow is national eat ice cream for breakfast day? No, I did not. Yeah. I you, don't, but my four year old's going to find out about that. And you're going to have a big say, bowl for kids, breakfast. You the, the best dad in the world. That's for sure. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, uh, tomorrow's our first day of spring sports. I'll, I hope my athletes don't find out. <laughs> don't eat ice cream for breakfast. I don't want to see it later. <laughs> But as far as, you know, motivation, I, I think I, I can thank my parents for that. Um, you know, they always taught us to leave things better than the way you found them. And that um, you can help anybody and, and benefit everybody that you come in, t in contact with. And I think that when I go out, 
you know, and I, I do what I do. I, I try and keep that in mind, leave things better than the way I found it. Um, nice. and I know it's, we, we had a motto and I feel, I don't know if you knew this or not, but at Penn Trafford, we had a motto and it was kind of, you know, it, it was kind of quirky, but it, it was true. It's our goal is to help you achieve yours. I saw that I somewhere that. there. And, and, and honestly, I, th I think that, you know, my goal is, is to help other people achieve their goals and whatever it may be and in, in, in an athletic training arena, it could be, um, you know, help a kid become a starter or help a kid become a third stringer, whatever it is, you know, you, you just want to be able to help them no matter what yeah. that motivates me. Nice. All right, Coop, last question. What does it mean to be an athletic trainer? What does that mean to you? It's a deep one. Um, it means to be an advocate for the uh, uh, the athletes that you're you're okay. responsible for. There you go. Um, to 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 always be the voice of reason for them because they're not always looking through the right lens. But we as a as a consummate professional. We have to look through that lens the same way, no matter if they're a starter or a bench warmer or a freshman or a senior. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. We got, we got to be their advocate. Be the advocate. That's great. That's great. Well, Coop, um, you've been awesome to chat with, and uh, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to share your story with us. Um, if you don't mind, you know, if, if there any of the listeners have any questions for you, do you um, can you share maybe um, some places that they could reach out to, to ask questions? Yeah, so um, email is uh, coopatc1 at gmail.com, and that's the number one, coopatc1 at gmail.com. And I'm on, I'm on Twitter at – sorry, I don't, I don't know what my own Twitter is. <laughs> I think it's uh, – yeah, right. It's um, Cooper Larry Five. Cooper Larry Five. And uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, help out. You know, any way I possibly can. Any athletic trainer, I don't care what setting. You know, freshman, a, a, a YP, a rookie, wet behind the ears, or a seasoned veteran, I'll help them out no matter what. Awesome. Thanks again, Coop. Um, and just want to say thank you to the listeners. Um, let us know what you think of this format and um, any topics that you would like us to, to talk about in the future. Um, you can leave a comment below. Um, until next time, I'm Adam Richmond. I'm Philip Hensler. And this was the Pats Podcast. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. That was good. Larry, I bonus question for you so I had the honor of working at Penn Trafford after you had uh, retired and I can say from experience working all over western Pennsylvania that that school was set up and largely in part to you everything you've said today you I could relate one experience in my short time there on just how much respect that you've built with the profession um, just because I came in as an athletic trainer immediately I was respected everybody looked towards the athletic training staff, Jen, Gina, Lauren, myself, as experts in the field. And the only way that happens is consistency and dedication. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, how did you take that How did you take that experience and work with the state? How, how did you bring that level of quality up to the state level? Because I know you've been really dedicated to uh, Pennsylvania as, uh, and athletic training. But I think, Honestly, I think you just need to listen to people and, and people understand that you, you are listening and you have, and I don't mean sim sympathy, but if you have a sympathetic ear and you, you listen to them, all of their issues, and you can come up with maybe a, a better alternative or prove to them that maybe it can be done at a higher level, um, they'll listen. But you, you can't get to that point unless you listen first. And um I had a principal once tell me that he observed me in class and he said, you know, Coop, one of the things I really like about your style of teaching is you listen to your students. And I, I, you know, I was kind of surprised. It's just what I do, you know, 
And, and he said, um, you, you need to continue that in your volunteers. And, and so I, I, I tried to um, do that. And I don't necessarily mean I didn't make an effort. That, that's what I do. But every once in a while, I'd find myself, yes, you, you need to listen more than you need to, to talk. And when you do that, and then you circle back later, um, you'd be surprised how, how, what a difference, the different way that people relate to you. And I, I think that the ability to listen, um, you know, sometimes he, people hear you, but they don't listen. And, right. you know, I, I think it's important that you just you have the ability to, to listen to people and, and then um, come up with a, maybe a different alternative than what they had thought of. And I guess just it is you, crazy how comfortable athletes get with you, right? Like, yeah, I don't feel gosh. like I give off the vibe of being this open guy that needs to yeah. hear this stuff, but yet there, here we are and they're, they're yeah. telling me everything and things that you probably don't want to know. It's just, yes. I guess it's part of the role. See, I think I was going to say, I think that is part of the role. We um, it's, it's how athletes will come to us with problems that they won't come to a coach or to yeah. even their parents on. And it, it lets yeah. us be that, that friend to them, yeah. but still maintain that professional balance to, uh, to get them the help they need and get them to where they need to be. That's, at yeah. least one of the reasons why I love athletic training. You know, non, non-judgmental third party, right? Yeah, there's, exactly. an article, there's an article I just posted this morning on Facebook. Are you guys both on Facebook? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's, about the, it's about a wrestling coach, and um, he's out in St. Louis. You guys need to read it. I'm getting goosebumps telling you just guys. thinking about, about it, yeah. Because this guy gets it. This guy understands his role as a teacher slash coach mm. in this, this school. And, and if we had more people that did that, oh my God, the, the sky's the limit. This guy gets it, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, those are the kind of coaches you love to work with, right? Like the ones that oh, yeah. aren't necessarily worried about wins and losses. Um, obviously everybody wants to win, but taking boys and making them into men, taking girls and making them into women, you know, making, being a role model. Um, those are the kinds of coaches. And, and for some reason, those are the ones that are successful as well, right? Like yeah. they built that culture um and and that is is what makes them successful not you know over analyzing um you know x's and o's on the field or running their kids into the ground it's you know the the ones that are leaders and actually just teach kids how to be good people and somehow that that translates onto the field which i love like that's yeah that's, i love those seriously coaches. you guys gotta read it you'll you'll read it and you're like yeah cooper's right this guy yep. gets it. yeah 